From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador, this is From the South, and I am Sweeney Gray. We begin in Colombia where the peace accord is under threat following the arrest of former FARC negotiator Jesus Santrich. In an official statement, the FARC party called on Colombians to keep pushing for peace and sent support to Santrich, who has begun a hunger strike. Jesus Santrich was arrested for alleged drug trafficking on Monday at the request of, US drug enforcement, of the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration. In a press conference, FARC leader Ivan Marquez said the detention threatens the Havana Accords and leaves the peace process in a critical situation. With the capture of our colleague Jesus Santrich, the peace process is at its most critical point and threatens to become a complete failure. FARC supporters have been protesting against the arrest outside the Colombian Attorney General's office. They say the FARC leader's arrest threatens peace in the country. They are calling for the Havana Agreement to be implemented in full and are criticizing the Colombian government for submitting to the detention request from the United States. This is extremely serious because it sends a disastrous demoralizing message and creates a lot of uncertainty. In addition to the undermining of the Habana Agreement, it's a very bad message for the Colombian people, for the former combatants and for the peace that our country so badly needs. Our correspondent Jose Manuel Jimenez has the latest on the announcement from the FARC on the San Riches detention. The Revolutionary Alternative Forces of the Commons is calling on President Juan Manuel Santos and all the peace accord guarantors to hold an emergency meeting to discuss the arrest of former FARC leader Jesu Santrich and what is going to happen now with the peace agreement between the government and the group. They are also asking the Special Jurisdiction for Peace to examine the evidence presented by the General Prosecution's Office against Santrich. Now, the U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency, or DEA, is accusing Jesus Santrich of exporting 10 tons of cocaine with a street value of $320 million to the United States. Now, many in Colombia see this as an attempt by the U.S. to sabotage the peace agreement. So let's take a look at who Santrich is. He was one of the negotiators and signatories of the Havana Peace Accord. He held a 25-day hunger strike in 2017 in protest of the government's failure to free political prisoners. He has campaigned for amnesty and pardons for FARC members, and he was due to take up one of FARC's 10 seats in the Congress as a member of the House of Representatives. He sits on the Committee for Implementing the Peace Agreement. The Colombian government says the detention was carried out according to the rule of law, and should not affect the Havana agreements. Colombian President Juan Manuel Santos gave a press conference shortly after the news broke on Monday evening. The accord is very clear. He who commits a crime after the signing of the final agreement will be subject to prosecution under regular jurisdiction for new crimes committed. The general prosecutor of the nation has informed me of the results of rigorous investigations. There is concrete and conclusive evidence that prove that Jesus Hernandez, known as Jesus Santrich, has committed the crime of drug trafficking following the signing of the agreement. Lawyers for the former Brazilian president, Luiz Ignacio Lula da Silva, are planning a series of legal appeals to try to overturn his detention. In an exclusive interview with Telesio, one of the lawyers, Cristiano Zanin, says that the sentence against Lula aims to plans to end his political career. Zanin described the legal process as judicial warfare against the former president. What is happening here in Brazil, especially with President Lula, is sadly something that is happening all over Latin America. Political leaders are being accused without any proof and with clear political motives. This is what has happened to President Lula. He is a victim of lawfare or the abuse of the law to politically persecute someone. These accusations have a clear objective to end President Lula's political life and to prevent him from running for president in this year's election. The lawyer also criticized the Supreme Federal Court's decision to deny Lula his right to fight the 12-year sen sentence while remaining free. He called it a violation of the federal constitution and Brazilian law. 
he added that he will use every ju judicial option to prove Lula's innocence and bring him back to the political scene. Lula hasn't committed any crime, and he should not be in jail serving a sentence. This is the reason we say that he is a political prisoner. He is a prisoner who did not commit any crime and was taken to jail, going against the federal constitution and the country's law. Thousands of Brazilians continue to rally outside the federal police headquarters in Curitiba, where the former president, Luiz Ignacio Lula da Silva, is being held prisoner. Protesters demand Lula's freedom and consider him a political prisoner. On the second day of protests at the Lula Livre camp, delegates from all over the country continue to arrive. Many social groups have come to defend Lula, just a few meters from where he is being held prisoner. Protesters pay tribute to his government's many achievements. For example, during his administration, 2.4 million families benefited from public housing programs. We made the greatest progress in public housing programs, which help low-income families. Today, we are sorry to see the loss of such programs, the loss of everything we built. Members of the resistance camp also include oil workers, who greatly benefited from Lula's policies and are now fighting for his freedom. I am a product of the Workers' Party government, because they were the ones who opened up the possibility of applying for jobs in state enterprises like Petrobras. In the previous government of Fernando Enrique Cardoso, there were no jobs, but the Workers' Party began a competitive recruitment process. Another sector that greatly advanced during Lula's administration is education. Students have arrived en mass to demand that Lula be freed. Buba is one of the many students who have Lula to thank for the opportunity to go to college, making Brazil a country that has over 7 million people with access to higher education. I'm in college because of Lula, thanks to a scholarship program and affirmative action programs. I'm a student at a public institution that only exists because of Lula, so I'm thankful for his work. No other government has ever done for Brazil what he did. This is why we fight, so that they can continue their work for the people. The numerous voices that make up the camp reflect the extent of Lula's work and they vow not to quiet down until they see their leader free again. We're going to take a short break now, but join us again after a look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting. Welcome back. Mexico's four main presidential candidates gathered at the American Chamber of Commerce in Mexico on Monday to discuss business issues. The candidates attended the chamber's 101st General Assembly. The negotiations for the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, dominated much of the discussion. The candidates spoke on matters of respect, free trade, and dignity. Leftist frontrunner Andreas Manuel Lopez Obrador called for mutual respect between Mexico and the United States. 
No, uh, our country, our people does not deserve a discriminatory treatment. The bilateral relationship between the Mexican government and the U.S. government should be based on mutual respect and cooperation for development. According to the latest polls, Richard Anaya, Ricardo Anaya, who leads a, leads a right-left coalition, is 11 points behind Lopez Obrador. Anaya says trade should remain free and open and that NAFTA should be modernized. I think the best scenario would be for there not to be restrictions, no new tariffs, and for us to have a free and just commerce. I think that would be the best thing for both nations. The ruling Institutional Revolutionary Party candidate Jose Antonio Meade and independent candidate Margarita Zavala also called on the Mexican government to demand respect from the United States in the negotiations. Mexico, in the relationship with the United States and in the commercial definition, has to present itself with dignity, with clarity and with the certainty that it is a wide, varied and deep relationship which is built, defended and defined every day and where there are more actors, not only those in the government. We had to look for a way to not only be united by geography and this overtakes with all due respect President Trump who we have to demand respect from any fact, to demand respect from any state leader, and we have to let him know that one decides how one wants the relationship to be, if we are friends or not, and nobody wants an angry neighbor. Some 600 migrants in Mexico City who remain part of a dwindling caravan have marched to the city's iconic Basilica of Guadalupe, chanting and waving signs against U.S. President Donald Trump. The caravan had about 1,500 migrants at its peak, but people left the group after immigration authorities intervened in the southern town of Mateus Romero and screened men, women, and children, following pressure from U.S. President Trump. The organizers decided to end the caravan in Mexico City instead of at the U.S. border, as had previously been intended. <laughs> Donald Trump has already done what he had to do, very well. He has his right. He has used us in a certain way. But really the people who have the right to ask asylum can exercise it in an orderly manner, a peaceful way, a way with dignity. The U.S. president has also canceled his trip to the America summit in Peru. And he will not trouble to travel to Colombia either as he had planned. U.S. Vice President Mike Pence will attend in his place. In a statement, the White House said that Trump will remain in the United States to monitor his response to Syria after last Saturday's alleged chemical attack. Pence's communications director said Venezuela will be one of the main focuses for the U.S. Vice President at the summit. And our correspondent in Lima, Jaime Herrera, has more on the America Summit and the Alternative People Summit taking place at the same time. The White House has just confirmed in a statement that U.S. President Donald Trump will not participate in the Summit of the Americas in Lima, which will take place on April 13th and 14th. Michael Pence will attend on his behalf. In the meantime, social groups are already organizing themselves for an alternative summit, the Summit of the People. Peruvian and Cuban students gathered yesterday to exchange their experiences of their political struggles. In the meantime, the Summit of the People continues with self-organized workshops. Latin American delegations will participate and will share their goals, how they will try to participate in government decisions and impose an agenda that will benefit the people and the civil society. The summit's inauguration and the welcoming of the different delegations are planned for this evening in the district of Jesus Maria in Lima. In addition to discussing objectives and goals, there will also be cultural events to pay homage to the Cuban and Venezuelan fight against imperialism. They will also pay an homage to the struggle of leaders like Lula da Silva and Cristina Fernandez, who are currently fighting to stay included in the political process. This is just the beginning of the Summit of the People. Thank you, Jaime, for that report. So for more on President Trump's decision not to go to Colombia and Peru, let's go live to our correspondent in Washington, Jorge Hestuso. Jorge, let's start with the implications for the America Summit. With no Trump and with doubts about the attendance of several other Latin American leaders, it's not a good start for the summit, is it? It's the first time that a president of the United States is not attending the summit of the Americas. The previous seven 
uh, occasions were attended by the President of the United States. This morning, the official line came from the uh, White House spokeswoman, Sarah Sanders, and she said literally that the president will stay here in the United States to oversee the American response to Syria and to monitor developments around the world. So most definitely there was not really in the plans of President uh, Trump and of course it's up to every possible analyst to see or to read in between lines the importance, the relevance that the president of the United States give to the region of Latin America and South America in order to cancel not only the trip to Peru, but also the trip to Colombia. It would have been the first time ever that the President of the United States and Donald Trump in, in the presidency will come to the region. So this is now in the bucket list, in the pending matters of the White House. And we're hearing that U.S. Vice President Mike Pence will attend in Donald Trump's stead and that he intends to make Venezuela his primary focus. Um, what does that exactly mean? What do we expect the Vice President to say on Venezuela? What are your sources telling you? The sources are not telling us anything because uh, eventually they are keeping the, the cards very close to the chest. Uh, there, is no, uh, there is no anticipation of what will be the position of uh, pres Vice President Pence. So uh, we have to play by ear and see uh, when we get a little bit closer to Friday, that is the first days of the summit, if we can hear for some uh, reliable source what eventually could be the strategy that uh, Vice President Pence goes to the summit with. And thank you so much for that, Jorge. One more question. Um, the U.S. president has decided to break tradition and not attend the summit. Um, and he said he's staying to overlook the um, alleged chemical weapons attack in Syria on Saturday. What are we expecting from him um, with this particular issue on Syria? Well, uh, we have to wait and see because yesterday he says that it was going to be a very strong response to those attacks in the, and he said, in the coming 24 to 48 hours. So far, we don't know yet what will be the case. What we did know officially this morning is that the, the, now they're talking publicly about this, that uh, Russia is um, jamming the GPS of the um, all the airplanes, you know, the non-tripulated uh, non uh, planes, the drones that are overflying the area. And for the U.S., the drones uh, plays a key role because they're doing some reconnaissance uh, mode in the area. So that presents a large difficulty or a new officially admitted difficulty for the Americans if eventually we're planning to send, as they did the last time, missiles to the area, because now it seems that they're not counting with that tool that could be the drones uh, patrolling the area. So uh, we have to wait and see if in reality he's going to commit to his word that in the coming, at this point, about 24 hours, something in terms of uh, strike is going to take place. Thank you so much for that piece of information. They're really interesting security stuff coming out of the United States because of that um, alleged chemical attack in Syria. And always a pleasure talking to Jorge Hestoso. In other news now, Colombia, the human rights activist Piedad Cordoba has announced her withdrawal from the presidential race due to f personal reasons. In a press conference, she announced that the reason for her withdrawal is her mother's delicate health. She also said this does not mean that she will retire from politics, since it is her passion. The 63-year-old pledged to continue to fight for peace in Colombia. In Argentina, Congress will discuss on Tuesday the legalization of abortion. A new bill proposes that women should have access to a termination up to 14 weeks if the mother's life is at risk or if the pregnancy is the result of rape. At least 1,000 experts will give evidence and the discussions will continue until May. Feminist organizations and pro-life campaigners 
have protested during the last few months to influence the vote on this particular bill. As the Atlantic hurricane season is less than two months away, the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States and the Global Climate Change Alliance have launched a climate change and sustainable land management awareness project in the region. The project is in the form of a whiteboard animation aimed at simplifying climate change while re reaching a max the maximum number of people. The project's designer explains how it works. I think oftentimes we take for granted um, what climate change is. We just think that, oh, it's when there's flooding and etc. But there are a lot of other variables to climate change. And for us, we just wanted to show the different <coughs> areas that the project is seeking to highlight and to affect um, when we talk about climate change and sustainable land management. We're going to take a short break, but join us again after another look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting. Welcome back. As we've just heard, U.S. President Donald Trump, along with ally, his allies, including France and Britain, has threatened a forceful response to an alleged chemical attack in Syria. The U.N. Security Council held an emergency meeting to discuss the situation. Tension between the United States and Russia has escalated over claims that at least 40 people died in a chemical attack on Saturday in the Syrian town of Doma. Many Western countries say a toxic gas was used and that the Syrian government, backed by Russia, was responsible. But the Russians say they have not found any trace of chemical weapons used in Duma. Now let's have a look at some of the other stories making headlines around the world. World leaders have met at the Boao Forum for Asia in China. The annual summit is a platform to discuss the economic issues among the member countries. Many leaders spoke against trade disputes amid rising tensions between China and the United States. China's President Xi Jinping said all countries should be treated as equals and respect each other's social systems. No country should practice hegemony, pursue power politics benefiting oneself at the expense of others or bully the weak. We should properly manage and control differences in order to achieve lasting peace. Yulia Skripal, the daughter of former Russian double agent Sergei Skripal, has been discharged from Salisbury District Hospital in UK. The duo were allegedly poisoned with a nerve agent last month in Salisbury. Sergei Skripal's condition has been also reported to be stable. The UK accused Russia of poisoning without substantial evidence. Russia has denied any involvement. The FBI have raided the office, home and hotel room of Donald Trump's personal lawyer, Michael Cohen, in New York. Cohen has been in questions regarding a payment to adult movie actor who allegedly had a relationship with Donald Trump in 2006. 
It is believed the raid was conducted following a referral by special counsel Robert Mueller, who is investigating Trump's 2016 election campaign links with Russia. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg is in Washington to testify before U.S. senators on the data breach scandal. He is expected to face tough questions on, in the two congressional hearings. Facebook is in the middle of a controversy after millions of users' data was exposed to the British data mining firm Cambridge Analytica. On Monday, Zuckerberg issued a statement apologizing and taking responsibility for the abuse of privacy. <coughs> And finally, El Salvador is celebrating International Circus Day with a show of some unique performers from around the world. For Salvadorians, the circus is not only a game, it is a way to transform society through art. Clowns from Bolivia, Ecuador, Peru, Mexico, Costa Rica, and the United States and Spain have gathered to commemorate Social Circus Day. Performers believe this art is able to create social change in a much more effective way than through politics. It's also a tool to keep children away from violence. In one of the countries with, in one of the, countries with the highest rates of violence in the region. And that story has taken us right to the end of this newscast. But for these and many other stories, you can find them on our website at talisiotv.net forward slash English. You can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Talisio English, I'm Sony Gray. Thank you so much for watching.